Hé, hey, stuur je? Nee. Nee. Wil je wat water hebben? Nee. I became interested in water already from when I was a very young kid because my grandfather, he was running a mill or a, a pump house. So I was always very fascinated by how he operated the pump house and we were fishing there and we would go there every weekend. And then when I grew up a bit, I was a very fanatic ice speed skater. I was always skating with my dad and my family on the, on the lakes and the canals in the Netherlands. Papa, was it dan rivier voordat het de gracht werd? Ja, maar die gracht is er al 400 jaar. So I've always done things with water, either skating or playing at the water. And I, I really enjoy understanding the processes that are associated to water. Now I'm studying hydrology in mountains. I love mountains, so combining those two and understanding these processes in mountains, that is what drove me into that direction. The mountains of High Asia are the keepers of water for millions of people. It is here, in the Himalayas, that Walter has focused his research efforts for over a decade. It's October 2013 now, and we are back again in Nepal, and we will try our first flight for the October uh, mission. Today, his research is renowned worldwide for his holistic approach to piecing together the water cycle of this massive mountain range from moisture in the air to a steady flow of water for people downstream. I have a team now of six people. There's one person really focusing on snow, one on glaciers, one on the atmosphere, one on climate change. So that's really fantastic. And I try to coordinate it all and bring it all together. We started our trek into Langtang Valley. The crazy thing about working here in Langtang is that we start off with very dense forests and we end up on icy peaks where there's nothing but ice and, and rocks. This extensive reservoir of fresh water is extremely challenging to capture in a single study. With rapid changes in elevation come major shifts in humidity, rain or snow. I had some lots of snow yesterday making it difficult to predict how changing weather patterns will impact the water cycle of high Asia. That's really one of the big challenges that we face in this area compared to other mountainous areas where the altitudinal gradients are just not as large. That's why it's so important to actually get the field data from locations here. Walter's group combines remote sensing and satellite data with measurements from the ground, from weather stations placed at different elevations along rivers or glaciers, measuring everything from rain to snow drift. So we are here at a precipitation measurement station in, uh, in Kare. We do a lot of precipitation measurements because the whole hydrological cycle is driven by precipitation. So it's basically in the form of snowfall and rainfall. This is the beginning of the water cycle but also on the temperatures that can cause the glaciers to melt. It's an equilibrium between gaining mass and losing mass. So you could imagine that the atmosphere is actually the key driver to add precipitation or to let the glacier melt. So the climate is really influencing the hydrological cycle. If weather patterns change, then you can imagine that also uh, the hydrological budget of that place also changes. We're now on the glacier, making our way up quite steep, quite high. And also the glaciers store water, so how much that can be used in future under warming conditions. They also determine how much water can be used by humans and whether that's sustainable or whether that's declining in the future. Glaciers supply water when rain is scarce, but they themselves have characteristic differences. Some of them relatively clean, and others covered in debris, rocks and sand that they gather over time. And you can imagine that they behave differently because they have this cover of rocks on top, so that has an effect on the melt, of course, of the ice. And if it's thick enough, then it is inhibiting melt underneath. But if it's, if it's very thin, then it actually increases the melt because it's an albedo effect, so it darkens the ice. That is possible to model on a larger scale, but to understand what is happening on a single glacier with these rocks on top needs measurements from the field. I'm mainly working on measuring debris-covered glaciers by looking at them with UAVs or drones as they're commonly called. Every field season we use the drone to fly over the glacier and get new data. 
Though gathering drone imagery twice a year provides invaluable information about ice loss or growth, it is difficult to make conclusions about the long-term behavior of these glaciers in the face of climate change. Five years is a bit short to really unravel changes that have a long-term impact, but it does show us the surface processes of these debris-covered glaciers, and we don't really know a lot about them at the moment, and we need to understand them better to predict future changes. And using the UAV data, we can really look at those changes in minute detail. Measuring things in the mountains is very complex, and those areas are very inaccessible. It's very difficult to work there. Because you are at a very high altitude, there's a lot of problems with, with the stations. And we even had a big earthquake in Nepal, which destroyed about half of our equipment. But it's the only way to really get to the truth of what is happening. So the remote sensing helps us to get a large overview and to extend what we see actually on the field. But going on field, we get much more precision about what's going on. And also we bring new things that were not expected. One unexpected finding that could only be brought to light with careful field measurements has to do with the direct loss of snow to the atmosphere. A process called sublimation, and one that persists at high elevation, where strong winds and the sun's powerful rays help to turn solid water into vapor. We did not know whether sublimation was important because there are no measurements at all until now in the Himalaya. And so it was the first guess that if you have a lot of solar radiation coming in, and we have a lot of wind as well, then it must be important. I think it's really special to have snow that just disappears into the atmosphere. So you don't know how much it is, and that would be really interesting to find out. But five years of data has its limitations. Walter's team has set out to link water loss to seasonal or annual changes in weather, but also to shifts in broad-scale climate. And these trends are decades in the making. It's important to look at the climate aspects of the hydrological cycles, because we have to know what are the exact processes that link the climate to the melt. We have the atmospheric pressure and the wind direction and intensity. It's difficult to sort out changes because I only have four or five years data and uh, there's a lot of interannual variability into the processes. Climate change is one of the major drivers in our research. You can just see that there have been very strong changes in the mountains in recent years. But a period of five years is too short to derive any significant trends. I mean, climate is the average weather of 30 years. So the way we do it is we use observations of a short period to tune and calibrate our models. And then we use our models to do climate change simulations. Climate modeling is what allows us to set global temperature targets to minimize the destructive effects of warming. The 2015 Paris Accord is a global agreement to limit warming to between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. But what does this mean for the mountains of Asia? We show that 1.5 degree increase in temperature globally means a 2.1 degree temperature increase in Asia. And that's, that's due to a process called elevation-dependent warming. Then we started to look at the impact of this 1.5 degree and we found that even if we meet this ambitious target, then still we will lose about 36% of all ice volume in Asia. But I think in a more realistic case, it will be somewhere between 50 or 70% of the total ice volume that we will lose by the end of the century. I found that quite shocking. So for me, it's really also a motivation to continue this work and maybe also gear it a bit more towards, you know, what can you do to adapt? Ruben, gaat goed? And there I think I'm, I'm positive. I have a lot of faith in technological innovations. If you see how fast things have been going with sustainable sources of energy or with solar energy or all kinds of technological innovations. And I think in the end we'll solve it, but we really have to act now.